Let's talk about Bethesda and making mods for their games. Now, I, I had a long history of modding, long before I, asked, I joined the Oblivion community. I learned a lot of tricks. So I was able to just recognise game code almost when I, when I read, I could read it like English, right? I see, I'd, I'd learned so many computer languages over the years that I could read it like English because there were a few common rules applied to all of them. And it helped that when I was at school in the early 80s, the computer course I did was pretty much a computer science degree, but from school. That was the early days. There was no computer science degree at the time. That was, that was the start of it. When the school switched over to teaching you Word, that's probably when the computer science degree became a thing. Right, so anyway. And that, the number of games you edit, you know, allows you to, to just expect certain things you know when you pick up a new game you're not starting from scratch you're starting from you're starting from a point you know that's a bit further on than most people so you're able to spot how mods are made how games work things like that and you can talk the dev language without the devs even knowing whether you've seen any of the game or not and that happened quite a lot i mean i was actually in quite a lot of chats with various devs of various games because i guessed how their system worked based on their interviews <laughs> and um, I even got invited to a few beta tests because of that and help out and some of them include me in the credits I've influenced many games over the years right just because just because I could see how they were doing it <laughs> right and um, give them ideas for improving things but when I got to the Oblivion community I wasn't used to editors I was used to hacking my way into games and um, edit the editor to me was like, oh, this is bliss. I can do anything I like. And there were people around me are moaning about it. I'm thinking, you're moaning. You should try doing what I've been doing for the last 30 odd years or whatever it was at the time. So I made myself a little, little um, character mod just to get a feel for it. See, a character is a good thing to learn on Oblivion. Like on, on any Bethesda game. Because you've got A... You've got to do the level lists for the character, you know, the clothing, their armor, everything else, right? You've got to create some kind of list for equipment. You could just pile it on. That's one way of doing it. It's a bit dirty, but if you do a list, you can have him update his equipment based on the character level. And then you've got um, various other settings. And then you've got voice files. You could give him a whole conversation. Your character might be very chatty, you know? Oh, yeah, I went down the shops here with there, and I saw Bob down there. You know, and you could, you could make him really fit in with the game. So it's a good thing to start on. And so that's the first tip right there, is start with characters, right? Do it properly, put the voice acting and everything. And I started, I didn't really, I mean, I'd done voice acting, but not to the degree that Bethesda's games require it. Because before I might do one or two lines, here, here and there, maybe a voiceover for a briefing, so your target is over there, send your mechs in and destroy the lot, that kind of thing. But with Oblivion, there was hundreds of lines, thousands of lines to record, and that was new to me. I had to update my equipment. I started from scratch. I was using a really cheap mic, all kinds of stuff like when I first started. Uh, and I only managed to get updated on that because people were actually helping me with the equipment, you know, getting me the equipment together so I could um, do what I did. That's the fans of man, the real fans. So I appreciated that, by the way. I was able to do a lot of my better work because of their help. Anyhow, this is the... Um, uh, the character led on to me thinking, well, I can tackle something bigger. This is straightforward and easy. Bethesda are basically giving me everything I need. You know, So I went on to do Kvatch Aftermath, a world space quest mod with hundreds of characters, hundreds, thousands of lines of dialogue, right? And uh, I did it in three months. That made me enemies. Two types of enemies. <clears throat> You know, the Kvatch rebuilt mod, mod fans, they hated me for being the first series of Kvatch mod. And the law fans, because I'd only been playing the whole series for five months at that time, didn't know anything about the law, didn't really bother me in the slightest, I didn't know anything about the law, but they made my life hell because I didn't know the law. I later found out they didn't know the law either. <laughs> when I started learning the law in my next mod, because I learned from that experience, and I started asking them questions. I realised they didn't actually know the law. They were going on forum law, not actual game law. So when you get stuff coming into you from the haters, right, look it up. You'll probably find they're wrong. <laughs> right? I mean, don't get me wrong, I got to the point where I automatically assumed they were wrong in the end. 
because they were most of the time. I just didn't see the point of wasting time looking up nonsense. I would already done most of my research. I'm recognised law more now for oblivion, so people know I know quite a bit about it. So you can I proved, you know, I picked up the ball and I ran with it. Anyhow, that lesson, right? The, the lesson from Kavach was mainly a negative one because it. I mean, the quality wasn't as good as my later work. Was, there's no doubt about that, right? Because it was a first mod, and people didn't seem to make allowances for the fact it was a first mod on a new game, and it was it was really my first experience with their editor as well, you know, being an editor. So mistakes were made, and um, but lessons were learned. A lot of lessons were learned when I started making Origin of the Mages Guild. The lessons were well and truly learned in a lot of cases. Uh, it, it was a, my first law mod, and I made it really well. People actually um, loved it. They still like it today. People mention my work, Origin of the Mages Guild, is one of the works they mention all the time. I was on, um, I can't remember the site now, it was, a, it was an Oblivion Law site, <coughs> and uh, I got some really good advice from there, from real law fans. Um, I realised that, you know, there were so many nuances about you know, Elder Scrolls law that if you say who's the best in and whatever, you're going to get three or four different answers and all of them are correct. You know, it says uh, one of them, one of the guys said to me, look, you've got to learn it yourself. You know, there's, you can't really be told, you have to learn it yourself. And I did, I followed his advice. Uh, I think his name was B, I think. Right? But um, it was the best advice I got, so I did. Right? And I don't know if you've noticed, but the plots in my mods change perspective considerably from mod to mod. Especially if you're playing Helgen, which is a purely Imperial type mod with an Imperial attitude towards it. The whole thing is shouts Imperial, you know? So you've got the Imperial version of the law in that one. But there's another version, the Elf, there's the Elf version of the law. Which paints, um, you know, the, the whole different story. You get you touch upon that in um, in the Sky, Skyrim's um, vampire mod. Um, I can't remember what you call it now, but Bethesda touched upon that with the uh, snow elves. You know their attitude. But if you don't know the law, right, it's interesting to read it from different perspectives. Don't expect there to be a definitive answer. That's 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 the mystery of test. There's no definitive answer, right. So, anyhow, you're not going to get the law, you know, if you read, that is a thing actually, I'll cover the law first. The law itself of oblivion is written down in books after the fact. The law itself from the previous game might not match the books at all, right? But when it hits the books, that's the official version, right? That's the official version you go with. You can still use a version from the previous game if you wish, Sometimes it's fun to do that, but sticking with the books usually means it's going to stay consistent. Now, you can't avoid reading the books. You can't, not if you're making a law mod. So, your best bet is to go onto these uh, law sites, you know, there's quite a few of them about. Read up on them sites, everything you can think of, right? Stay away from the fan base ones unless you want to get more insight into something because a lot of the fans are really into it and they've got some unique ideas. I actually included a library of fan ideas in Oblivion, right? In, a, in the Elder Scrolls, uh, in the Origin of the Mages Guild mod because I found it interesting. I thought other people might find it interesting too. So I literally made hundreds of books for that library that are purely fan fiction, you know? And um, I made sure everybody knew it was fan fiction as well. But anyhow, when I was making Oblivion, I'm making um, Origin of the Mages Girl, I got more help, more help from voice actors, better voice actors. It was um, it was a lot more organised. The voice actor was a vast improvement over what it used to be. Still, still falls short, but I, I, I was maintained that I'm a player making a mod, not a professional making a mod. So if the voice actor isn't professional, that's just tough shit because I'm not a professional, I'm a player. Right, and I decided, you know, to leave the door open for anybody that wanted to have a little go at voice acting, right? Says so to actually join me and uh, have their work included in the game if it was reasonable enough, right? And um, I wasn't snobbed that way, 
I mean, I understand why people want the voice acting to be brilliant, but let's face it, voice acting is always about opinion, and if you don't like a person's accent, it doesn't matter how good his acting is, you're never going to like it. And that's the other lesson I learned. But anyhow, once you've established yourself, people will come to you and offer to help. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> if you're actually really good at making, planning a mod and making a mod, doesn't mean you're going to be very good at individual parts of the mod. So if you spent your time, you know, telling everybody how great you were and you hated everybody else, like a lot happened on the, a lot of that went on in the Bethesda communities, right? You know, you either, you, 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 it was either them or you were inferior, that kind of thing. You end up having to defend yourself against that kind of argument all the time, right? It says if you couldn't get along with other people, then you'd basically, you wouldn't be able to hire anybody. Well, I've got a track record, right, of forming teams. I go from just being Giscard modding to Mechstorm or Respawn or whatever at El Teg. And as a consequence, I got to I got to a stage where my, where the name on the mod changed from my name to the team name. That's usually when people came in to help. Like I had a guy called Starfire and a bunch of dozens of others helped me on Mechstorm. Each one of them were good in certain areas. So I was able to A, make my mod first, then have them come in and take over certain aspects. So the second version, third version, fourth version was better than the first version because better people helped me redo the work I'd done. And that's a, that's a key process, right? A lot of people say, I want to make a grand world. What's your experience? Nothing. I'd made a cup of tea, does that count? And they're doing absolutely nothing. They spend years talking about it, making videos of what they intend to do and never do a stroke of work. But if they make even a small mod, like I, think, I can't remember the name of the group, right? They did what I did. They released, I think it's the Breville mod, not Breville, uh, Bruma mod, right? They're doing a massive world mod. But somebody did, did what I would recommend and just made a Bruma world first, right? For Oblivion, I think it was, or Skyrim. People saw that and they go, they can get a mod done. So people join the team. And that's the way to do it, right? Do something you can achieve first, just to prove you can do it, then you'll find it easier to hire people because they'll know you mean business. Second thing is, when you're making mods, especially big ones is, don't do anything you can't achieve. Don't set your sights so high that you'll never achieve it. Remember, you can always, you can always add in version two, version three, version four. You don't all have to be into in version one. And sometimes, you know, Doing it, you know, building it up over different versions is a fun way to do because you can take a break from one mod, work another mod, come back to it. it it's good to do that way because we all get burnout, you know. Sometimes you might do a mod and then a new game come out. You want to go and play that game and you want to come back to the mod later. So do it in versions, you know. Get Make sure each version you're going to release is planned out in advance. An achievable situation. The first version is always the hardest. The other thing is... When you're building the mod, or let's call it a car, when you're building the car, 99% of version one is going to be boring, mundane crap. That there is your test, your mod hood test. What, what do you call it? Uh, what's the right word for it? This is the bit you do to, to become a modder. Right? The 99% of boring crap nobody ever wants to do. If you do that, you've earned the right to that 1% at the end. Right? That 1% is a bit you'd enjoy at the end. That's version 1. Right? And that's where people usually stop. When you do your next big release, right, version 2, because maybe if you're just making bug fixes and minor things, and then you go from 1 to 1.1 to 1.2 to 1.3. When you do a massive um, addition to a thing, go to version 2 or version 3. That is usually 50%. All right. Yeah, 50% boring and 50% good. You get to do more of what you like to do. So it's best to do things from version to version, version 1, version 2, version 3, rather than try and cram it into the first version. Always recognise the first version is the most exciting, but it's also the most boring. Right? Getting, getting the additions, seeing where the feedback text, the mod, stuff like that, that's where all the excitement is. And if you've got a team around you, it will usually appear for version 2 or version 3. Version 1 is you 
on your own version two is everybody else coming in so it's version two when you get people going i can do better than that do you want me to try you go yeah go ahead right that's when it helps that's the natural order of things when you're making mods never be afraid of um, of telling somebody else they did an excellent job because they want to hear that from you they join you because they've got confidence in you you need to show you've got confidence in them i've built up several teams over the years and I've done it by being fair, open, and basically congratulating people when they did good work. And recognising the fact when they can do better work than me. Because you know? it's, it's important they know they're good. You know, Some of them went on to do amazing things of their own. And I'm proud to call them friends. Now that's not easy on the, in the Bethesda community because of the way the trouble is, you know, surrounds modders all the time where people are always attacking you because some mod over there declared you an enemy of them and their works or all their fans race across and attack you or some toolmaker does the same thing because he wants to seem important and your new mod makes it look like he doesn't know what he's talking about or stuff like that they just don't really get along but trust me you should right you need to be honest you need to talk about these things with people you need to be, to let them know when they've done something well and another thing, if you're a player making a mod, don't try and act professional. Don't pretend you're a professional, right? Just make it perfectly clear, just a bunch of players making a mod, right? Make sure the players who try to hold you to a standard higher than you're willing to go understand that. Because at the end of the day, there's an awful lot of trouble coming from people that are expecting you to produce professional quality work on a budget of zero. I had to buy all the equipment needed to make my Bethesda mods and I paid hundreds of pounds for various bits and bobs, sometimes thousands to do it. And only a few people donated to help me pay for all that. The ones doing the morning never never donated a penny. So don't listen to them, right? Set your own standards. Don't do anything that isn't achievable. And stick to the plan. See you in the next one.